I must tell you, it was mayhem. The reports I got from people who were on the scene, even the doctors who were there, first aid people in white coats, were beaten up by cops. People were just smashed wide open. And it, the Strawberry Statement movie, as I indicated, which I don't like as a movie and I don't think accurately depicts the events, uh, but nonetheless does depict the brutality of the police, it gives you some idea of what happened. Uh, the revolutionaries barricaded in every possible way in the building of what may have been the president of the university and flying a National Liberation Front flag from the masthead were too frightening for the cops, to be very frank. And so ultimately they negotiated a surrender with the police after everything was, you know, pretty nearly over and they came out peacefully. Lots of people were charged and were faced with the prospect of prison sentences. A great deal of furniture had been damaged or destroyed. Secrets indicating Columbia's ties with the industrial military complex were revealed. So there was a lot of heat, you know, and there was a need to raise money for their legal support. But this was a desertion on the part of the, unfortunately, I'm sorry to say this, but it should not be uh, dropped out of the history books of the 60s was a desertion from what I gather of the blacks in the uh, dorms and their specific dorms, which are very exclusive. And uh, the Living Theater came back from the United States after having gone into exile in 1962 or 63 because the Internal Revenue Service demanded taxes from them. Julian Beck and Judith Molina were the uh, main moving spirits behind the Living Theater. And uh, uh, Graham, uh, Bill Graham gave them the Fillmore East, which is one of the main centers of the youth culture, the equivalent of Fillmore West, where all the rock bands were playing, gave them uh, an opportunity to present their play uh, and raise money for the student legal defense. Well, after they had finished their play and, uh, you know, got off the stage, Ben Morea grabbed the microphone and said, everybody stay here. We're going to occupy the place until we get a pledge from Bill Graham to have at least one night a week free for the whole community and all its bands. Well, we all stood there and finally Bill Graham gave in, you know, it would have been very unsporting to do that. The, the Murray is speaking for the community and uh, ultimately, too, uh, we started having, uh, I think it was every Wednesday, all the local rock bands, not all of which were very good, but still all the, ro the local rock bands. Uh, playing there until Graham got fed up with the whole business, dropped it, kicked them all out, and finally closed down the Fillmore East and went back to the West Coast. In fact, things were beginning to close down, and you could see that very perceptibly. There were coffee houses strung all along Avenue Way, right next to the Tompkins Square Park. They were beginning to close down. They had been major centers of activity. And suddenly, bingo! We hear of the occupation in the newspapers of Nanterre University in Paris, followed by the strike in Sorbonne, the French Sorbonne, and then the general strike that swept clear across France. And this was somewhere around May. And millions were out. The red flags were flying in Paris. There was talk of revolution everywhere, uh, so it seemed. Everybody was in a state of utter euphoria. Now you see the French are just caught up <laughs> with where we were in 1966. They were sort of two years behind. Except that they had a big working class that was controlled by the communist CGT or General Confederation of Labor. And their working class had a long history of militancy as well as revolutions going way back 150 years. <laughs> And the Communist Party was one of the biggest parties, and the Socialist Party was one of the biggest parties in France. So you, had a, you still had an old working class, somewhat like the working class of the 1930s in the United States, 
as well as in France. Things had not changed. The Gaulle was changing France. And it was that tension that gave rise in great part to the explosion that took place. On May 12th, barricades were raised in the left bank of Paris, and there was a tremendous battle. Black flags were raised for the first time. We had raised black flags in the 1960s in all our demonstrations, and these were reported in the newspapers. The French suddenly began to raise black flags since I don't know when. I mean, I can't tell you how far back the black flag of anarchy was raised in France. And we began to hear of this massive general strike that involved 8 to 14 million workers. Of everything was closed down except food stores. And food was being given out on credit by these petty bourgeois French entrepreneurs who normally would be expected to be as stingy as possible, but nonetheless now suddenly seem to become terribly involved. I believe a great deal of that had to do with the tension that was going on in France, first of all, between the Gaulle's attempt to modernize France, quotes, close quote, to industrialize France, to break down the old face-to-face -face patron system where a boss managed about 10, 15, 20 workers and almost dealt with his business like a family business, and where agriculture was primarily the job of peasants, not agribusiness. And I think that the Gaulle, Gaullist technocrats were transforming, very rapidly transforming France into something more like the United States, a corporate France, big industry, agribusiness. And they even developed a police force called the CRS. I don't know what it stands for in French. It was a mobile kind of army and was employed initially in large part to control the French peasants who were prepared to take direct action as their farms were disappearing and being turned into large agribusiness plantations. There was also a great sense of alienation in France. The French were watching the United States. I would not be surprised that Colombia had a very profound influence. The Colombia strike had a very profound influence on France. These points have not been made in accounts of 18, 1960, 1968. I'm almost convinced the Colombia business profoundly influenced what happened in, in Paris. The initial cause of the st student strike, of course, was a question of whether or not males could visit female dorms. It started out in a small, uh, newly built university called Nanterre, which was in a Muslim district, primarily made up of North Africans. There you had Danny Cohn Bendit and uh, a whole bunch of young people, many of whom, a number of whom were really influenced, and this is not commonly known, by the red and black group, Nouge, Rouge et Noir group in Paris, which turned out a, a kind of mimeograph periodical uh, that was influential among the new type of anarchists. The old anarchists, the FAF, the French Anarchist Federation, was anarcho-syndicalist. It had virtually no influence, whatever. It was made up of mainly elderly people. These newer anarchists, Noir et Rouge, okay, black and red, uh, were younger people in their 30s, not in their 60s, who uh, thought in terms of, in fact, the counterculture, in fact, issues that we had been raising in the United States as early as 64, 65, and 66. And this was just percolating into France very slowly. And uh, Danny, Danny's brother, was almost a facsimile of Danny. I've met him. I've met both of them pretty well, and I mean fairly uh, in close quarters, so to speak. Uh, there's only a 10-year-old Danny Cohn Bendit. That's all 10 years older than Danny Cohn Bendit. And in my opinion, was in large part the theoretical brain behind Danny. But um, those are merely observations that are not likely to be known, and I think should be told. And Danny in the March 22nd movement, which is what it was called, the Vendemar movement, which had escalated this dorm situation into a whole protest, was finally uh, reached explosive proportions when the, uh, the head of Nanterre called in the police to break up 
student activities, sit-ins and whatever you like, and meetings, unauthorized meetings. You've got to realize that this was very important in France, the fact that the police were called onto a campus, because unlike the United States, going back to the Middle Ages, the French have always claimed the university as a special preserve, which belonged initially to the clergy and was under canon law, not under civil law. Now, of course, the Middle Ages had come to an end. The French Revolution had ended canon law. But the tradition of the autonomy of the university and the fact that it could not be invaded by the police was so strong in France that when the Germans occupied Paris and began to occupy universities, it produced universal hatred. It was one of the most important factors in inciting French students during the Second World War to enter the resistance that their university, that sanctity of their university had been invaded. After the war, that sanctity returned again. You know, the university was not supposed to be... Uh, the university was supposed to police itself. It was not to call in the French flicks, you know, the cops with their capes. And what happened was that the president, calling in the cops, had created what might have been a controllable situation into a hurricane. So the strike became furious. Meetings were held, police were fought with. Nanterre students went down to the Sorbonne, which is the most exclusive school in France, certainly in Paris, where they train all the future prime ministers and top-notch bureaucrats of the government. Nanterre was completely sympathetic. They all held a meeting together in the Sorbonne, when again the police were called in. I mean, they kept on provoking this situation more and more. Fighting began to break out in the streets outside the Sorbonne, inside the Sorbonne, and before long the whole Latin Quarter neighborhood became involved. People came downstairs and they threw flower pots on the cops. Uh, you'd be amazed. Uh, you know, you don't know what a French innkeeper is like. He's the most reactionary middle class swine you could run into. But they, you know, the idea of doing things like this, of beating up on the students, who incidentally were very privileged in France. Only 7% of the student body was make up, made up of working class children, in contrast to the United States where over 50% was. So going to a French university meant that you really were a child of the bourgeoisie or the petty bourgeoisie and well-to-do. Well, to sum up the whole thing, ultimately, uh, the police were in a state of complete confusion. The mayor of Paris was in a state of complete confusion. The government was in a state of complete confusion. De Gaulle decided to run off to Romania, wherever it was, to get a medal. He wasn't on the spot, and he felt that this tri trifling incident could be just ignored. Finally, the police withdrew. The students built barricades and th uh, and, uh, along major avenues and streets of the uh, Latin Quarter. And uh, very heroic, you know, they took the pavs or paved the rot stones, carved stones that made up, that go way back in time, by the way, to the Paris Commune, that make up the streets of the Latin Quarter in beautiful uh, designs. They built uh, barricades there on May 12th. And when they were assaulted, furious fighting took place at night. Again, everybody became involved in the neighborhood. Everybody threw water pails of water on the police. These are middle class people that I'm talking about, as well as students fighting on the barricades. Nobody was killed. People were severely wounded, but nobody was killed. The police never pulled a gun. <laughs> they fired tear gas canisters directly at your head, you know, and that might give you a skull fracture at worst, or, you know, send you to the hospital with a serious facial wound or your eye wound, a facial wound or eye wound at worst. In any case, this produced an a national uproar in France. The cruelty with which the students, the courage with which the students fought and the cruelty with which the special police called the CRS behaved. It wasn't just the Parisian flicks, you know, ordinary patrolmen and the police who were involved, but the CRS with helmets and, you know, looking like Martians, practically, with all their gear that uh, a million people demonstrated in the streets of Paris, one million, two days later, after the night of the barricades. I would say this was roughly about May 14. And the unions, under the pressure of the membership, called the general strike for one day. 
Well, the communists were very careful to see that the students didn't mix with the workers. They were kept aside. <laughs> Communist goons, you know, would brush the students away. They were pushed off to a side of the demonstration. Because the communists, who were very much accommodating, were now just like the old-time socialists, you know, <laughs> interested in parliamentary positions and controlling the government or getting seats in the government, did not want an unstable situation in, in Paris. And they played a literally as close to a counter-revolutionary role as you could in those days. Uh, workers were immediately shepherded away from the students. The students called a special rally at the Champs de Mar, where the Eiffel Tower is located in that open area. Some of the workers managed to make their way to the student demonstrations, but the dis explicit effort on the part of the communists to try to keep the two groups, students and workers, apart from each other produced fury. And uh, the workers were bust out of the area as quickly as they uh, came to the end of the demonstration. Well, what happened? Way up there near the coast in Nantes and Saint-Nazaire, suddenly, uh, two days later, the whole city went out on general strike just like that. Not because of the students. They just didn't like something. It wasn't very clear. The third one, the first ones to get started were the sud aviation workers, those who make airplanes. Before long, the whole city of Nantes and its companion city, you know, just the way Minneapolis and St. Paul are collect, collect, uh, connected with each other, went out on general strike. The ships in the harbor began to raise red flags. The factories raised red flags. The workers uh, welded management into its offices, which were comfortable quite comfortable, and serenaded them with songs from the French Revolution and the Paris Commune, and fed them, treated them very well. They kept the telephone lines open so that the radios could broadcast from the offices of the entrepreneurs and executives of Sud Aviation, who said, well, the students are treating us very nicely, and so on and so on, but we can't go home. <laughs> and there was that playful atmosphere. Farmers came in from the countryside with their... This is unusual, you see, because there was never any great love between the peasants and the workers. Came in with their tractors and uh, flying red flags. <laughs> so this imagery was absolutely incredible. And before long, like a sickle going right through, this general strike spread within a matter of days. It almost seemed like hours, like wildfire, right down to Paris, and Paris was closed down closed down. Banks were closed down. Post offices closed down. Everything closed down. Everything closed down except for the television cameras, which played a major role in spreading this strike. The camera operators, TV operators, camera operators, and the commentators were very sympathetic. And they broadcast this news all over France. And people saw this shouting and striking. And you know, how many people have not seen the movies May, June, 68, with students throwing Molotov cocktails or bricks and the CRS coming in on them and fighting and challenging and the melee and everything like that. So, a general strike swept all over the country. The communists shrewdly called out some of the workers in the industrial areas which they controlled so that they, their goons, could occupy the factory and the workers would go home, <laughs> raise the red flags, and they kept the factories intact and kept the students from approaching the factory. You couldn't reach the workers there. But in Paris, the Renault plant, the great auto plant out there, uh, went out on strike on its own and pushed the strike, and thereby forced the communists to call other strikes. It pushed the strike, and the young workers, being in the lead, pulled everyone out, and then the communists at first tried to get them to rotate on ships by going on strike. When they couldn't succeed and they saw that they were going to lose control of the workers, they declared the strike legal, <laughs> acceptable to the union. I mean, it was a fait accompli, but they declared it acceptable. The workers raised red flags, sang the Internationale, and everything went wild. It was beautiful. In the meantime, communist hacks were putting up signs, beware of provocateurs, meaning the students who may try to talk to you, warning the workers against Asian, Asian provocateur. Uh, additionally, they tried in every possible way to keep 
the uh, workers who had fully occupied the Raynaud plant from talking to the students. The students, in turn, just turned their part of Paris into a playground, removing fences from parks, and creating the most astonishing posters you've ever seen. And they would poster the whole world of their faculties or schools, from roof down to basement, <laughs> so that all you saw were the windows and then you saw nothing but these posters that were being put out that were absolutely sensational. We take our uh, well, imagination to power, uh, be realistic, do the impossible. Uh, society's a carnivorous flower. <laughs> it's incredible. You know, uh, we take our desires to be reality because we believe in the reality of des our desires. I know who did that one. <laughs> He was a next situationist who was a friend of mine in Paris in '67, and he had painted that onto a classical painting of, you know, a Chapelier riding a horse in the Sorbonne, and that became very popular. So this tremendous sloganeering and post art, post poster art emerged everywhere. Finally, uh, you know, things got really hot. The students made an attack upon the bourse, together with a lot of young white workers. I mean white workers, Parisian workers, young Parisian workers, who were no longer w playing footsie with the communist trade unions or the socialist trade unions. Trade unions were trying to keep the situation under control. And they kept on going to the workers and gave, trying to find out what their grievances were. The workers would write up their grievances and cahiers, which goes way back to the days of the French Revolution, notebooks. And the, cahiers, and the grievances were vague. They were incredibly vague. We don't like the kind of supervision we get. We don't like the alienated atmosphere of the plant. You know, they weren't strictly economic. They were talking about the culture of the factory. They were talking about the systems of nomination. And some places they actually called for outright workers' control. Uh, there was one plant that went out, made up of engineers primarily, I wouldn't call it a plant, more like a lab, that won everything it liked, and then after it went back, and when 68 came around, they went out again, and they said, we got everything we wanted economically, now what we want is workers' control of the plant, which was in fact very sophisticated, made up mainly of engineers and technicians doing highly complex techn technical work. The football society went on on strike. They had a big banner. The football strikers, football, football players are also workers, and we are on strike in solidarity. You know, words to that effect. Red banners were everywhere. Bank tellers were out on strike. So people clustered around anyone who had a hand radio to get the news. Not a leaflet fell to the floor. Everybody passed out leaflets from one person to another. It isn't just the original person who gave out the leaflet. The leaflets just wouldn't hit the floor. So everybody wanted to read. Everybody got excited. Even the power workers, you know, who controlled the electricity in the plant, and the metro was closed down completely, the Spanish, the uh, Parisian subway, would have brownouts just to show that they were in sympathy, but they wouldn't prevent the people from having light. So they'd have an occasional brownout, you know, suddenly the lights would dim and they'd go back on again. It was an expression of solidarity with the strike. The only ones who did not go out on strike were the printers of the radical, so-called radical party newspapers. L'Humanité, the French communists, printers didn't go out on strike so L'Humanité could appear. And the socialists and the this and the that and the whatever you like, they remained at work so that propaganda could keep coming out. Well, I couldn't get to Paris at that particular point because no airplanes <laughs> were landing at all the airport, which is now called the Gaulle Airport, I take it. And uh, I had to wait and wait, and both B, my first wife, companion, friend, uh, uh, had credit cards, which I didn't have. She was working as an academic researcher. And finally, the first break we could get was around, well, the events are called the May-June events. There was a lot going on in July. I mean, it isn't like you turned off a spigot. The communists managed, after several plays with the workers who refused many of the uh, agreements, though at least the first agreement, they accepted the second. The communists managed to maneuver the workers back to strike in a very ugly way. The Metro was the most striking example of all. 
They told one terminal line on the subway that another one had gone back, therefore they ought to go back. Then they'd go to the other one because the second one, which was really the first one, had gone back and told them they had gone back and bit by bit they got the metro working. Once the metro was working, more began to happen and bit by bit the workers drifted back and the strike came to an end. And also, of course, the communists uh, got the CGT, got a lot of benefits, economic benefits for the workers. And there's no point in kidding yourself. When bread comes to ideas, bread often takes over where ideas, I think, should be more dominant, but then that is my attitude. I can understand workers, you know, being workers. I didn't expect them to be angels. I didn't expect them to be demons. Ultimately, Danny Cohn-Bendit was kicked out of the country. The communist, by the way, in the most vicious man, playing on his Jewish background. You know, he was actually not born in France. He had come from a family that were refugees of Hitler and had German citizenship, not French citizenship. So the country expelled him as being uh, uh, uncontrollable or undesirable. That was the one. And so another poster appeared with Danny with his big smile saying, nous sommes tous indesirables. We are all undesirables, you know. They picked up on everything and ultimately the thing began to wane especially as uh, summer vacation began to come on. And I hate to tell you, students, and you must face this fact realistically, will not give up a vacation if they have a vacation coming. Uh, very significantly, however, this conflict still continued. And when I managed to get to Paris on uh, June, July 13th, two weeks after the end of the May-June events, the place looked like it was occupied by an army. Paris was simply crisscrossed with blue buses containing these CRS men with these Martian type uniforms. Cops were to be seen everywhere. Uh, Flicks were walking around with machine guns. Uh, it was incredible. And uh, we thought that we had come, both B and I thought we had missed the main events. Well, to my utter amazement, on July 13th, the very night that I fell before I fell asleep and got some rest and woke up again, bingo, the pl whole city exploded. <laughs> and uh, we went down to the Rue de Madeleine, I forgot the name of it, where there had been major street fighting in May and June. And sure enough, we got caught up in this CRS attack with all kinds of tear gas being thrown at us and being chased around by the police. We were caught among a group of Africans and the police were very racist. Thereafter, I spent about two weeks in Paris getting news about what had happened. I wanted to report these events. And I wanted to report them from the bottom up, not from the top down. I didn't want to report them the way you would with the UP or the AP. I wanted to report them, you know, directly as... Uh, as what I had seen and what I had heard, and I spoke to all the leaders, student leaders and the like, and got the most detailed imaginable reports, documents, papers, even all the back issues of L'Humanité and newspapers, and before long I was loaded with stuff, went back to the United States, wrote it up and published a hell of a lot of it, uh, some of which now appears, two of articles of which now appear in... Uh, how scarce any anarchism, my book, uh, my first, well, I would say my most important book uh, of the 60s.